Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Wednesday, November 9th, 2020 at 7.01 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over to my right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment, up to three minutes each. Should there be time remaining, we will take additional in-person comments. In honor of Veterans Day this week, we would like to express our gratitude to all the veterans of the District 58 community who have served their country in the armed forces. We would now like to have a moment of silence in their honor. Thank you. With our veterans in mind, we would like to proceed with our flag salute. And leading us today is gonna to be O'Neill Middle School with Principal Dravala and Assistant Principal Vermeer. Thank you. Hi everybody, we um, have our representatives tonight who are presenting virtually for us. So we've got a, an audio recording. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. All right, well, thanks for having us. We've um, tried to do this presentation a couple of times, and we're glad we're here tonight to be able to talk. It's got a, a little bit different format than what we're used to with people in person, but um, we're really happy to be here tonight and talk about some of the great things that are going on, going on at O'Neill. Um, we're going to show a little video about life at O'Neill. We're going to talk about um, uh, our focus on learning, our plans for um, working towards the future, our connection to the community. We have a, another little video clip from our PTA. So um, at this point, I'm gonna introduce our assistant principal, Haley Underwood, who's gonna start with our video. It's Haley Vermeer. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so our student council members that were leading us in the Thank pledge you. tonight were Rebecca Snaffer and Jordan Reynolds, our eighth grade, two of our eighth grade student council leaders. Um, for those of us that work at O'Neill, we know that O'Neill is a very special place, and so we wanted to start tonight by showing you a little video um, where we asked some of our students and staff what makes O'Neill a special place and what we love about on-site learning. Um, and so as you watch this clip, you are going to see a couple pictures where kids don't have masks on and are within six feet because those pictures were taken before the pandemic. Um, I promise you they were not taken this year. But watch this video and take a quick glimpse of what makes O'Neill a special place. Hello, my name is Rita Casper. I've been at O'Neill for 10 years. 
Um, I'm their library assistant. I'm Ashley Molinari and I'm in eighth grade. And my name is Nicole Faroli and I've been teaching at O'Neill. This is year 20. Um, my name is Jen Manneke and I'm in seventh grade. Hi, I'm Dominic West and I'm in eighth grade. Oh, I'm Caitlin Morgan. I'm a resource teacher, but I specifically teach math. Hi, my name is Sarah Pincus and I have been here at O'Neill for 20 years teaching. Um, uh, Joe Grippo, eighth grade. Hi, I'm Pat Donnelly. I've been at O'Neill for one year, been in the district for seven. And why I like O'Neill? Because of things like that. I love coming to school and seeing all my teachers and being able to teach in person. I love the students. They're so much fun. They come with a positive attitude and the staff is amazing. I work with wonderful people. Um, I just like being here with all my friends. I also like all the teachers. I love how friendly all the people can be and all the teachers are. And I love O'Neill because the teachers come together, they love the children, we help each other, and it's like a nice community. I love that all the teachers are really nice and all the students are really nice and like nobody's mean and it's just kind of fun to learn here and it makes it fun. Um, and the best thing about O'Neill um, are the, the teachers, the people. They're wonderful, they're supportive, they're positive. Um, and I love O'Neill because I feel like we are a family and I feel like we take care of each other and we help each other and I always am happy to come to school every day because I know ma no, no matter what challenges I might face, there's going to be some way to figure it out. So I love O'Neill. I love the kids being in school because they want to be in school. Every single student told me they want to be here. They want to be with us. They want to see the other kids. I just love seeing the smiling faces. I just like it. I think it's easier to learn in person in general. I don't like learning online. I think it's just harder. It's easier to learn because online you don't always get the right stuff, but then in person too, it's nice to talk to the teachers and be able to interact with everyone. Back in person, it's easier to get stuff down and like it's uh, everything's easier to learn. So on camera, it can freeze up or it's harder to hear a lot of people. And in real life, it's easier for teachers to connect with students. It's just easier to, uh, uh, <laughs> it's just easier to get stuff, and there's not as much tech stuff, so there's less things to go wrong. Um, and the best thing about seeing kids in school, um, there's actually a body attached to the head that you see on the screen, um, and they're just so much more willing to uh, participate and ask questions. And it's been wonderful to have some sense of normalcy in a world that is currently not. <laughs>to show you a glimpse of O'Neill and we know that um, that we are a special community at O'Neill whether we are on site or remote we will come together um, and continue to succeed at O'Neill. This next section that we want to talk about is um, our focus on learning and um, as you can see we've got both of our key indicators um, for reading and math and with our goals of where we want to get to be the lower portion of this graphic shows you where we currently stand um, in the fall of 2020 we're at the 75th percentile in reading and the 67th percentile in math um, one of the things to note is that those key indicators are based off of our spring scores with these being our fall scores we feel like we are in a great place and feel very confident that we can make it to um, those targets that are set. Uh, one of the things that we're working on, especially in this year, is that we really haven't lost sight of our educational goals. If anything, it's helped us really kind of refocus down to what's really important when it comes to that teaching and learning, the instruction piece. Um, the main thing that we're focused on in all of our areas is really looking at those grade level instructional standards and making sure that we um, are doing what we need to do because as long as we're focused on those standards we should be able to reach our goals without any problems okay. a couple of other things the way we go oh right here thank you um, the way we get to this focus on learning <clears throat> excuse me 
Uh, our school improvement days, our faculty meetings, professional learning time, institute days, those are all worked in various methods, whether it's through grade level meetings, whether it's through whole staff or department level meetings. Um, teachers are allowed to take some time and really focus on what are our goals um, with those key indicators, what are our goals with our school improvement plan, and, and how can we reach those. You can see that list of bullet points, things we tend to focus on. I'm gonna to touch on just the two things at the end there that um, are unique to both uh, middle school and O'Neill. The first one is our executive functioning and organization. This is something that's been going on in O'Neill for uh, four or five years now. One of the things we learn, or we all know about middle school kids, is that they can tend to struggle with executive functioning and organization. It's part of who middle school kids are. Um, a few years ago, we really sat down and talked about what are the things that we're trying to do to help kids with this, and how can we teach them these skills. Um, when you do some research, executive functioning is not something that you just are born with. It's a skill and a set of strategies that you have to learn to work with. Even as adults, we all have various levels of our ability and our success with executive functioning. And so we implemented a system at O'Neill where um, as part of student fees, everybody gets a zippered binder. Within that binder um, are a series of colored folders. It may sound simple, but everybody's science folder is green. Everybody's math folder is blue. So that when you're in a class, it's easy to remember, okay, everyone take out your blue math folder. It, it takes a little bit of time away from kids trying to figure out where is their math folder and do I have the right thing for this class. Um, the other nice thing about the zipper binders that we have is it keeps everything in one place. Um, it also has a pocket so that the kids can carry their laptop right in that binder. It's one thing to carry instead of two. Um, our teachers and our, and our staff do a lot of activities at the beginning of the year, helping our kids identify the system that we use for executive functioning. Um, our staff has done a lot of training. We actually um, uh, purchased the system from Rush Behavioral Systems. They actually invented it, and we got to see other middle schools that had success with it, so we picked it up. The other piece that we started to focus on last year at the middle school level was the idea of equity and instruction and inclusion. So uh, it's a piece that, that we're starting to realize is becoming much more um, uh, prevalent in our news and in our society. And, and we as a district looked at the idea of what are we doing to teach our kids about equity and inclusion. And, and this is an area where our assistant principals, um, Haley and Stephanie Ed Herrick, they went and did some training on equity and inclusion last year. And we were able to, to really make a focus of our professional development last year on the area of this. Um, we also worked with our leadership team to help them start to come along. I, I'm not gonna say that uh, we're a long way down this road. We've kind of just cracked the apple on this, but it is something that is a, a definite plan for us as we go forward in the future. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention as we talk about learning is how important the leadership team at O'Neill has become to us over the last year and a half. We did some work with our leadership teams last year on building leadership capacity within our teacher leaders in the building. And, and the pandemic and going to remote and then coming back this fall and working to get to hybrid learning, I can't stress enough how important our leadership team has been. This is a group of teachers who are doing this because they want to lead and they want to be an important influence at O'Neill. And, and some of the progress and some of the great things we're doing wouldn't have happened without all the support of our leadership team. So I just wanted to really um, thank them publicly. So one of those things that really makes O'Neill special is um, that sense of community. So that connection within our community, within our school community, and beyond um, just our school walls. So that's done in a few ways. One is through um, that connection within our school is done through a weekly newsletter um, to parents, students, and staff that goes out every Friday. Um, so just that ongoing communication piece um, with all stakeholders within the school. We also have just our normal staff communication um, through Google Classroom, through our website, through our remote learning doc, PowerSchool, um, Twitter, phone calls, and emails. And we really try to be proactive in our communication um, and just clear in our communication. Um, in terms of kind of reaching out beyond our school walls, our student council really has been the leaders in doing this. And it certainly does look different this year in the midst of the pandemic, but in the past, um, these are some of the things that we have always done. So one of those things is pennies for pumpkins, where home bases decorate pumpkins and students um, donate to their favorite pumpkin and then we support um, a nonprofit organization within the community. 
We also have our Operation Gratitude where students bring their Halloween candy and we send that to um, care packages to our troops. We also have um, food pantry donations that we usually do in, in Thanksgiving and then our Christmas family sharing. Um, so all of these are important pieces um, that connect us to the larger community. Our PTA is another way that we do that. Um, the last couple years, we've done a fundraiser called Raise Craze, and Raise Craze is a fundraiser where students um, do acts of kindness um, to raise money for their school. So it's been a really, I think, special thing to see our middle school students kind of go above and beyond within the community to raise money for our school. We also have our color run that the PTA sponsors. And then finally, um, our grandparents day, our very important person day, where our eighth graders have always brought um, a special guest with them to our school, where they can um, thank them for their influence in their life and lives and kind of just show them um, their life as an eighth grade student. We also just have continued partnerships with community organiza organizations such as um, the Downers Grove Police, Fire, the Township, and then we have our um, annual health lessons that NAMI helps present. So all these, it, all these factors, I think, really help us connect to our school community and then to the outside community. And I think that really is um, a huge reason why O'Neill is such a special place. Again, these pictures are from last year, but I think just show that sense of community in a way. All right, the next piece that we wanted to talk about is um, with the strategic plan and securing our future, which the first piece is the focus right now. Um, and we've got this slide up here about our three W's, making sure that we're wearing masks, that we're social distancing, that we're washing our hands. Um, one of the things that's been really impressive to see is how well our middle school students have done with coming back to school and the things that need to happen in order to come back and be at school every day. We really uh, have had almost no issues at all with masks and kids wearing them and, and being in school and, and social distancing the way they need to be. Um, there's a picture up there of that actually is our library that we've transformed into a learning space. One of the struggles that we had with coming back to, to school in the hybrid model was finding enough room to get our kids in and be able to maintain that social distancing. Um, typically, this space in the building is where we have our faculty meetings and it's made up of large tables. We were able to pull those out and, and put student desks in there to make it a learning space. One of the things that we've been more fortunate with at O'Neill um, is because we have a smaller student population, we've got a little more elbow room in the building to be able to move around. Um, one of the unanticipated things that we had to try to figure out is being able to find spaces for teachers not only with kids but for the, the teachers that are trying to work remotely. And um, it's really important, especially when we're working remotely, is that those teachers can find a space where they can be by themselves in a closed door area so they can get their mask off while they're trying to communicate remotely. When you layer in that we've got you know, 11 instructional assistants that well, as well that are trying to work with kids, it's taken a lot of work and planning on everyone's part in order to, to make it successful. And this is also where I wanna circle back to our leadership team. The monumental task that it was to get this uh, ship up and off the ground running with hybrid learning from figuring out room numbers and room usage and rotations and putting stripes in our hallway so that everyone's going one direction. Um, our leadership team has been amazing with making PowerPoints for the whole staff of, of let's do this together, of physically laying tape down, of carrying desks around and moving furniture out of classrooms. They made it happen. Um, our staff is wonderful and, and we wouldn't have been able to pull it off without all their help. And so I just, I can't say enough about how good our staff has been at helping us be successful. Um, the next piece is our PTA. And um, Suzette Stapleton, who is our PTA president, uh, made a video for us tonight to talk about them. Hi, my name is Suzette Stapleton and I'm the PTA president at O'Neill Middle School. Our mission is to provide support to the kids and teachers throughout the school year to enhance and improve the middle school experience. The O'Neill PTA conducts one major fundraiser each year called Raise Craze to support our mission. Organized by O'Neill parent Kim Venzen, Raise Craze is a unique student-led fundraiser that raises funds for completing acts of kindness. Students have organized toy drives for sharing connections, wrote letters to local veterans on Veterans Day, and collected food for Downers Grove area fish and blessings in a backpack. 
Over the past two years, O'Neill students have conducted 3,648 acts of kindness and raised nearly $32,000. The money raised goes to organize and support student activities such as the Color Run, 8th grade dance, VIP day, and student field trips. Additionally, the PTA has teacher grant program to fund items and programs that staff members need to support their classrooms, such as flexible seating and the school musical. While many of these activities are on hold the school year due to the pandemic, we are looking for alternative ways to support our students by purchasing remote learning kits for students in need and showing appreciation to our teachers during this time with PTA sponsored lunches and snacks. We are proud of how the kids and teachers are managing during this difficult time and hope the PTA can continue to support their efforts throughout the year. Um, and just to wrap up, we're, we continue to be hopeful that we can work our way through this pandemic that hopefully by second semester or by springtime, we're able to get back and we're able to do some of those larger activities like Grandparents Day and some of those other pieces that we really look forward to. A lot of those pictures that we were showing during that video are our um, quarterly pep assemblies, which are really an exciting thing to do and, and one of the things we, we really miss this year. Um, if we can't, we will be able to get through and have a fantastic year. Just like you guys know, we had to do uh, our promotion ceremonies in a very unique way um, last spring, but I felt like we were able to come up with something that was still a, a quality product for kids. So thank you for allowing us to present today. On behalf of Haley and I, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Matt, Haley, I, I did just want to take a moment and say, um, it was so great to have you guys back here. I, I think it, it adds a sense of normalcy to start our meetings back <laughs> off this way. It has been heavily missed and to, and to hear the pledge from the students and to, and to see the videos was, was so greatly appreciated. Um, it, it has been fantastic to hear this today. And just to let you know, we on this board, you're the, you're the first principals that we've seen in front of us here today, but I, or, you know, since all this started, but we know that you guys are wearing at least a dozen hats right now. And we know it's kind of a weird time. So thank you for stepping up and making good things happen for our students in the building. We really appreciate it. So thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. All right. Our first report to the board this evening is going to be on the Illinois report cards. Uh, Justin Sissel. Thank you. Uh, annually at the curriculum workshop, which happened uh, a couple of weeks ago, we do an overview of the background on the Illinois report card on all of the, the statewide data that will be coming out. And that data is released on October 30th. And then we would typically talk about it at this meeting. Similar to the way we discussed this at the curriculum workshop, this will be a very short presentation as there is actually very little data <laughs> because of the suspension of in-person learning last spring. So again, um, there are a number of things that we would typically spend a lot of time talking about and reviewing tonight. Those things are not a part of this year's school report card because they didn't take place or take place in full last spring. And so those includes things like the Illinois Assessment of Readiness and the DLM, the Science Assessment, any of those growth percentiles, anything around state mandated assessments for last year simply doesn't exist this year because those assessments by and large did not happen. So when you see the school report card, there are some uh, a very few pieces of data that are intact and, and without question based on last year. So our student enrollment, for example, is something that we, every district should be able to accurately report regardless of a pandemic. So that box at the top shows the district enrollment and broken down by all of the subgroups that the state does track through the report card. And that one is without any additional text which says it is a metric that is reliable. The next part of that slide shows, as an example, our chronic absenteeism rate, which there is shown as 4% and then again broken down by subgroups. You'll remember chronic absenteeism, as an example, is students who are absent 10% or more of the school year. But right under that box, there's a lot of text in red, which I know is difficult to read, but basically says this is calculated with some degree of concern. In other words, they have the data to calculate it, but we can't rely on it too heavily based on the way any school or any district may have reported attendance during the suspension of in-person learning. We don't know for sure if our methodology was consistent with every other school district in the state, and that's what ISBE recognizes there. 
Even further, we get to pieces of the report card that look like this, where there is quite literally nothing in the boxes. And so this would be our, um, our English language arts proficiency as measured by the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. It simply didn't exist. And so much of the report card looks very much like this. They published it nonetheless, and all of our, our both our district report card and the report cards for each individual school are now on our district website. But much of it looks exactly like this. So we want to be fully transparent in putting out there what co does come to us from the state, acknowledging that much of that simply didn't occur, and so there is no data with which to report. Similarly, the summative designations that are required by the Every Student Succeeds Act, because the data by and large wasn't present last year, these were not calculated anew for 2020. So all of those commendations, which are part of the school report card, will be listed for each school, but this is identical to what was assigned or what was um, uh, assessed in the 2019 school year, which is based on spring 2018 data. So they're literally just reprinting the same designations from the year prior, and this is all based on data that we reviewed in great detail a year ago now, and then at each individual school throughout the month of November 2019. As we look ahead, um, we do know that state assessment season is, is actually not so far in our future. Um, and one of the things that is different this year from last year is that there has not been a federal waiver granted for our state assessments. So that means that we will, as a state, be expected to administer the state mandated assessments. The other piece of information we've received from ISBE uh, just last month is that remote delivery is not an option for these assessments. So what that means is, regardless of the instructional model we may be in at the time of the assessment windows, the expectation on us as a district is that these assessments will be delivered in person. So for an assessment like the IAR, which is given to students in grades three through eight, that would mean if, we, if, if it were today, it would mean making a schedule that we would assess the students on site who were on site, but it would also mean reaching out to families and attempting to set up schedules to bring students on site specifically for this state assessment. And so obviously there's going to be a lot to that. There's going to be a lot to develop schedules that are going to make sense. There's going to be a lot to think about the protocols involved, a lot of communication. And so that will be um, what a large part of the work that will happen as we get into January and February. Uh, one of the things ISB is suggesting is to take a slightly, to look at slightly longer testing windows. They've extended the state testing windows in most cases in recognition, at least, of the fact that there will be challenges here. And so just to look at what those assessments are, the first two are the assessments that we choose to administer locally. And so that's our MAP assessment and our Ames Web assessment. And we will be continuing with a winter and a spring uh, benchmarking periods for both of those in January and in May as reflected on the screen. Access testing, which is our English learner proficiency assessment, that will take place between January 4th and March 2nd for all of our students who are eligible to receive EL services or who have recently achieved proficiency. The Illinois Science Assessment is for students in grades five and eight, and we have about a two-month window to complete that. The Illinois Assessment of Readiness, the IAR, will have about a, a six-week window. Spring break is in there as well, so you may recall that in the past we had moved that assessment to post-spring break in an attempt to capture as much um, instructional time prior to taking the state assessment. In this case, just knowing we'll probably need some more time to accomplish this based on what the state's asking, we're including a couple of weeks prior to spring break and then the remainder of the test window, the state test window ends on the 30th. In fact, in all cases, we're really going to the, the long end of the state testing window. And then finally, the kids assessment is listed there. This is a, a, a kindergarten readiness assessment that is t typically um, it's all observational type assessments. It's typically done prior to the 40th day of school. Those observations have to take place. This year, that is one place where we've been granted some leniency, and those observations can take place over the entirety of the 2021 school year. So that is the extent of the spotlight this evening on the report card and on our upcoming assessments, unless there are any questions from the board. Any questions? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Listed on tonight's agenda are 28 communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right, then we'll move on to our next report to the board with Dr. Russell and his superintendent report. Okay. Good evening. Um, for this uh, report, we're going to take a, a departure from our normal report, given everything that's going on, and, and do it in a, a presentation format. Uh, both Mr. Sissel and uh, uh, Dr. Uzentis will also be helping me as we go through certain pieces of this particular report. I do, however, want to start off uh, this report. Oh, here's the clicker. Thanks, James. 
One of these will be it, I promise. <laughs> uh, November 15th marks School Board Member Appreciation Day. And one of the things that um, I want to thank the seven members up here on behalf of all of us is just how dedicated this school board is. I, I'm not just saying this because I work for the school board, but I've worked with many boards throughout my career. And the best compliment that I could give the seven of you is that you are truly child center. You're champions for positive change in our school district and you dedicate the time and you treat one another like professionals and you run the board like professionals. I think our community can be very proud of how our board handles even the toughest of situations, um, especially this year. The last six months have been extremely challenging, not only from a time perspective for volunteer positions, but also from a mental perspective and a social perspective. And what I mean by that is this is one of those situations where I truly believe no matter what decision is made, people are going to be very happy, people are going to be very upset, and yet you've maintained that professionalism throughout the year. And so as we go into School Board Appreciation Week and School Board Appreciation Day, on behalf of all of us in District 58, the staff and the community, thank you for all the support you've given us. We would not have been able to make it all the way to this point through this pandemic without, of your, without your tireless support, and we really appreciate everything that you've done. So with that, we have a proclamation to read from the Illinois Association of School Boards. Um, whereas school board members are elected to sit in trust for the diverse communities, and in that capacity are charged with meeting the community's expectations and aspirations for public education of their children, and whereas school board members are entrusted with a guardianship and wise expenditure of scarce tax dollars, and they are responsible for maintaining and preserving the buildings, grounds, and other areas of the school district that the community has put in their trust, and where school board members are responsible for providing leadership that ensures a clear shared vision of public education for their schools that sets high standards for the education of all students and requires the effective and efficient operation of their districts and where school board members adopt policy to give voice to that leadership and employ a superintendent to administer board policy and are also responsible for the regular monitoring of the district's performance and compliance with state policy and whereas school board members selflessly volunteer countless hours to public service with no compensation, and whereas employers are supportive of their employees who serve as school board members, generously lending support and time, employers give their employees the opportunity to better serve the needs of the school districts and communities they represent through sometimes tremendous sacrifice to the employer, and whereas decisions made by school board members directly impact the quality of life and safety in their communities, placing them as the front line of American democracy. Therefore, it be proclaimed that November 15th, 2020 is School Board Members Appreciation Day as a way to honor those citizens who devote their time and energy for the successful education of our children. Again, on behalf of all of us in District 58, thank you for your service. Okay. So next up, we have some good and exciting news to share with our community. Um, we could use some bright lights uh, during this uh, pandemic. And um, I want to uh, thank uh, Principal Jason Lind, the El Sierra community. And I'd also like to thank uh, Kevin Bardo, Todd Drayfall, for working tirelessly to um, help secure a state grant for El Sierra. And we are now the recipient of a grant from the state of Illinois for a new playground for El Sierra School. Uh, El Sierra School, like many of our schools in District 58, is in desperate need of a new playground. We're very grateful for this grant. Uh, we were notified last week that the project is moving forward. I signed the paperwork and, and sent it in. Um, the anticipated date of completion is next fall, so hopefully this will be a summer project. And I especially want to thank our representative, Ann Stava Murray, for her assistance with this project. It, it is part of uh, some stimulus in grant money that each representative um, had and Stava Murray was able to set aside money for El Sierra School and because of that it has gone through so I think that's another highlight um, we have two members of the board who serve on the legislative committee and we have a, that's member Doshi and member Hannes we have a very close working relationship with all of our legislators and this is what happens when you do that and so we're very proud of that we know several of our other schools are working very hard to raise money we want to thank them as well. Uh, if other opportunities come up, we will certainly lobby on their behalf as well to try and get them over the hump. Uh, but we are especially excited and very thankful uh, to have a new playground at uh, El Sierra School, not only for the school, 
but for the neighborhood as well. Okay, um, earlier this evening, uh, I sent an email recommending that our district, starting on uh, Monday, November 16th, one week from today, uh, take a temporary shift for remote instruction for most students. And why I say most students is, we are not talking about taking this um, pause for some of our students with significant needs that really do benefit from being in person on a daily basis. Not that all students don't, but in particular some of our students with special education needs and other needs. Uh, we plan on resuming on-site instruction on Monday, November 30th. I'd like to take some time in our uh, report here to talk about the why behind uh, that decision and explain uh, and provide some clarity and answers for some of the community questions that I've gotten. Uh, so the first thing is what is an adaptive pause or a temporary shift? You're going to start hearing that phrase a lot over the next several months. Uh, that is a phrase from the IDPH. It's a recommendation that they've given us in terms of when you need to maybe pause on-site instruction. So this is a measure a school district can opt to take in the event there are too many logistical issues, high levels of spread through the schools, or a substantial disruption to the educational process. I would definitely say we're taking it for the first reason and the third reason um, here. This is typically a two-week period to allow the district to, uh, time to catch up with staffing and allow students or staff to finish quarantine periods. So one of the, the biggest questions that I've got, why two weeks or why are you starting it in a week? The first reason why we're starting in a week is we are an elementary school district. We are a district where many of our families um, are going to have to figure out childcare. We don't take that lightly. And we cannot tell our parents on a Monday that starting tomorrow or starting on Wednesday, we're going to shift. Our, our parents need a week. Quite frankly, many of them probably need a lot longer than that. And so we're very thankful for their patience. Um, but that is why we're postponing this one week. Um, also, why? the two weeks. Well, when you look at a quarantine period, it is 10 to 14 days. And so our hope is that after this week, we then have a good solid 10 to 14 days and we can get to November 30th and turn the corner. Uh, our current instructional model, and we recognize that it required many sacrifices to get to this point. But remember, one of the reasons why we voted on this particular model and why we recommended it was because we have the ability to shift from on-site to remote if needed. So I want to talk a little bit about our uh, decision making process. I think one of the most common questions is what is the metric that opens and closes school? What is the number? And I'm going to again be very open and transparent with our community. There is no magic number that will open and close schools. There isn't one metric that is a standalone metric. If this happens, this is what you do. Um, we had that clear metric in the spring, and that metric was simple. The governor closed schools. There is nothing like that now. The federal government is not making that decision. The states are not making that decision, and the local health departments are not making that decision. Instead, we have general frameworks or recommendations or guidance in that. So it is left on the local school districts. And so we are looking at many things. We're looking at national, state, county, local metrics. We're working with the DuPage County Health Department. We're working with other districts. We review the availability of local testing, which has, over the last week, been a big concern in Northern Illinois. We're looking at, do we have outbreaks in our schools? Is this spreading throughout our schools? We're also looking at, what is the impact on the educational process or the environment? So are we able to operate like we normally operate in a school? I bolded this one because this is primarily our concern right now. Not that these other things aren't concerns, but when you look at the biggest problem we're facing, it's that disruption to the educational process. Another common question I get is, Dr. Russell, you and other superintendents who uh, were in person, you're not listening to the health department. I want to assure our public, I listen to the health department. I meet with them most, mostly twice per week. I talk to them. We are listening to the health department. And I have a, uh, a quote from their website here that shows how superintendents listen and work with the health departments. So what are our local metrics? Well, they change daily, like everything, but one of the tools that we use a lot besides the DuPage County Health Department's website is Northwestern University's COVID-19 tracker. It is a very powerful tool where you can put in multiple zip codes and you can take a look at what is your 10-day, or excuse me, your seven-day rolling average, your 14-day rolling average. 
They also have a series of charts and graphs that we find very helpful to see where's our community versus the region and versus the state. Now what we've typically found in Downers Grove is that our numbers have been lower than what you would have seen in the county and what you would have seen in the region and what you would have seen in the state. However, when you also look at those numbers, you will see that they are steadily increasing. So while we're lower than some of those other areas, we are increasing and that obviously is concerning. Um, is this spreading in our schools? Okay, now I want to be clear. It is spreading in our community. It is very difficult to go back and say, this is exactly where person A contracted COVID-19. I think if we could figure that out as a country, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. However, we do an extensive amount of contact tracing. And we have yet to find a single case that originated inside of our school district. I also want to be very clear, I'm not saying that that can never happen. We just haven't found evidence of that yet. And I'm, I'm being very careful with my words. Because again, I can't say that that's never happened. But I can tell you we haven't found evidence of it yet. We have been very successful at contact tracing because our families have been so very cooperative with us. Our staff has been so very cooperative with us. When we talk to the county and the IDPH, they don't have the level of success that we do. They are, you see commercials all the time about if you get a call from this number, pick it up and talk to the person. Our families pick it up for us. They are very clear where they get it. And I want to assure the community that we are following up with families. We are calling close contacts. We are telling them, unfortunately, you're not able to bring your child to school. We are doing everything to the greatest extent of our ability to make sure that we don't have this virus coming into our schools. But again, as I've stated time and time again before the board, there is no risk-free environment during a pandemic. I can never guarantee that. And I, I, I think sometimes that can be frustrating for us as school administrators, and I also think it's frustrating for parents because I cannot create a COVID-19 free zone. I can never guarantee that students aren't gonna contract this virus. I can't guarantee that staff aren't gonna contract this virus. And sometimes when we send out a letter, people get very upset about, you know, see, I told you, now it's in your schools. No, I I'm gonna push back. It's in the community and individuals are infected with that and then we learn about it in schools. So is this causing a significant disruption in our schools? So this is what we look at when we're trying to answer that question. What does student attendance look like compared to a typical year? What does staff attendance look like compared to a typical year? What does the instructional continuity look like day in and day out? What's the system-wide impact of all of these adjustments? Can we do contact tracing within 24 hours? Today was the first day I didn't think we'd be able to do that because we had so many cases yesterday and today. I'm looking at Megan Hewitt, um, who's been wonderful to work with during all of this. We were literally on the phone yesterday from 12 noon till about 9 at night. We paused and then started right back up again at 8 a.m. and we continued to work up into this board meeting. That is how we're doing the contact tracing. It is nonstop and it's gotten to a point where it's very difficult to sustain. And then of course I want to talk about availability testing. The last week or so have been the first time where we've been hearing from our parents, I can't go get a test, or I went to the county and they closed at 836 or things like that. Now, the IDPH and DCHD are bringing mobile testing sites. I actually just retweeted that not that long ago. So there are new sites that are coming to Northern Illinois uh, for those who have been struggling to get testing, but availability testing is a big thing that we have our eye on as well. One of the things we're very proud of is the transparency that we're offering our community. Um, I do want to brag a little bit about our school district and our team. The amount of communication that we've been sending and the transparent manner in which we've been doing so, I, I, I do think that it is extraordinary and I don't see many districts doing what we're doing. Um, if a child has a symptom or a staff member develops a symptom during the day, we notify the classroom. If there's a positive case in the school, we notify the school community. Um, we post all of the cumulative data for the week and then total for positive cases throughout the year on our website. This is updated every Friday at 4 p.m. And so we are doing a really nice job at making sure that our community understands what we're seeing and so they can have the information. So I'm going to turn it over to Jane as we look at student absences. And uh, Jane's also going to talk about staff absences and some other th details here. 
right. As Dr. Russell has mentioned, we have looked at quite a bit of data. This chart regarding student absences is showing that last week of October. Now, granted, that is the first five-day week that we have to use. So when you look at 2019, the end of October, versus our student attendance and absences for 2020, um, you will see that increase. It, it starts off very slight increase. Um, but as we've continued on and looked at our data into this first week of November, there, the gap continues to widen as, as far as those absences for our students are greater in 2020 than they were in 19. And then a similar chart for our staff absences. Again, this is that first five-day week of on-site instruction. A couple important things to note as you're looking at that comparison from 2019 which is in blue, and then the 2020, which is in red, there doesn't seem to be a large discrepancy in some of those days. It is important to note that last year, we had grade level meetings. We were pulling staff for committee meetings, council meetings. Those absences are in our 2019 data. And so that's where, when we backtracked some of the days in October and the days in November that we've looked at, um, those numbers are more comparable because we were also pulling teachers for meetings that we just can't do this year. As we look more closely, this chart is really, you know, digging in daily and I check daily and then compare back to the previous year. Can we cover our classes due to these absences? So you'll see um, for 2020, the total absences, that's all employee groups, so that would be teachers as well as assistants, clerical staff, custodians. Um, and then that comparison with unfilled substitute positions. So on October 26, for example, 92 employee absences, 16 positions that we needed to fill that we requested subs for, we did not get an outside substitute for. And then on that right side, the 2019 data, you'll look Again, the, the total absences is slightly lower. Some of the days that Wednesday, the, the 82 staff members and the Friday, those were committee meeting days. Um, but still, the bigger piece to note is the unfilled substitute positions and looking at that discrepancy. So while the absences range is not that much higher, it's still higher in 2020, the bigger challenge for us is looking at 16, 14, 12, unfilled absences versus five, two, five, and three. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in this next slide. As we're, we're making our decisions and are talking about brainstorming those solutions, what is that process if we can't find a sub? As I mentioned, not all positions would require a substitute to begin with. So keep that in mind as you're looking at the total absence numbers. But we do use internal substitution, which is paying another certified staff member, and, and it's prioritizing really those, those teaching positions when we internal sub. We um, would pay a staff member who can then give up their planning and preparation time, that time they would be pro providing feedback to kids or preparing for um, their lessons in order to support a colleague and be able to prioritize, again, the on-site instruction for our kids. We have utilized specialist teachers, maybe a psychologist, uh, an instructional coach, um, an art teacher. When our art, music, and PE teachers were providing the asynchronous instruction, they had more availability, and so we were um, accessing staff who could support classroom teacher absences. Administrators as well have been in our classroom subbing. Those first few bullets, that's really not that uncommon. Last year, we, we've been in a sub shortage for three years now. And so we did utilize internal subbing in the past. We, we certainly had administrators who were subbing last year um, and were pulling other teachers. It, it's just a um, compounded, it's much more of a strain on our system this year given the pandemic. So the additional steps we've taken are combining our classes. So you may have an on-site class whose class size went down to eight students, another one with eight, that grade level. And if there's space and we can make adjustments in a building, we have had buildings where they were combining the two classes so one teacher could teach and provide the instruction. We also have looked at switching teachers within a grade level team. So if you have two third grade teachers, one teacher has to be home due to a quarantine situation 
and that teacher then could teach the students who are remote, even if they weren't previously their class of kids. And then the teacher who's able to be at school switches and would teach the on-site kids for that teacher. So we've had a, a lot of creative solutions. Our staff has been wonderful in, in all regards with chipping in to try to support instruction. Unfortunately, as Dr. Russell has mentioned, that there is quite a strain in, as we are pulling people, there are other, other important responsibilities and supports that aren't happening. A principal is in a classroom, but then needs to support uh, relocating a class, communicating with a family, figuring out how to move a child to temporary remote placement, or maybe a parent who's requesting the hybrid placement, the on-site placement, um, our coaches as well. So it's really is putting a strain because some of those other supports are not then able to occur. As we look at the, you know, has the district done this prior to COVID-19? Yes, some of these pieces, but as I've mentioned, there's definitely a greater impact because the demands on every position right now are much higher than in a typical year. Um, and so it's definitely more challenging to, to um, use this as our plan for a long period of time. The other piece that I looked at, um, if you remember the chart on the previous slide, excuse me, I continued on, as I said, I looked daily and tried to look at that pattern for the first week of November. So our absences for this past week stay in that 80 to 100 employee absences. Our unfilled substitute positions um, are just as high, not, not getting any better. So we're at 20, um, 18, 15, 17 positions this past week. When I went back and compared to 2019, the absences are ranging from 60 to 100 employee absences, but those unfilled positions really are still at two, six, eight. Um, and so that's where our challenge is right now. Last school year, um, we would have, as far as our estimated unfilled positions, we would have as low as 5% on a given day unfilled up to maybe 20 and 20 was a strain. This school year, we are at 30% of our positions being unfilled up to 45%. And so then we go back and look, I went back and looked at, okay, what's our, our recruitment for our subs? We sent multiple messages and survey to confirm our subs. We do have currently 130 subs who have responded they want to come and work and sub on site. We also knew we needed to get into this to see what really was going to be the, the factual data. Only 62 of our subs have actually come in to work on site. And so that's where part of this pause is to really help us. We need to recruit. Um, later on the agenda, you'll see we're requesting increasing, oh, excuse me, our sub pay from $115 to $140 a day, and really wanted to change our recruitment efforts to get new people in who will then commit for moving forward. So that is the update thus far. Hey, Jane, um, I want to jump in and ask a question here. I thought you did a fantastic job explaining um, how this, the data you have around staffing informs your decision-making process. Uh, I guess I'm just curious if I can get some more explanation in terms of uh, slide 12 when you talk about student absences. What kind of inferences are, are we meant to draw from that? And, and how does it inform um, the, the recommendation from the administration? Yes. So actually, on the next slide after that, I'm going to hit that a little bit, if, if, you, if you don't mind. I, I can be patient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Russell. Yeah. So um, this first slide, when we're asking, you know, is this is a disruption to our school? The answer to that would be yes. And, and why is that a disruption? First of all, I think our schools have done an amazing, amazing job. Um, it starts literally from the time you wake up as a principal, actually the night before, looking at your unfilled positions, contacting Jane, contacting us, trying to problem solve. You get to school the next morning, you're throwing a few more curveballs, and they've done a really good job. The issue that that becomes is, you know, in a typical year, you might be doing that one or maybe two days a week. Here you're doing it, you know, five days a week. And, and so, we hear all the time about the numbers in the community, the positivity rate, the number of cases. Well, that has a direct correlation, right? Because our staff live in multiple communities, although a great number live here. And so as you see that number increase, 
we see the number of teachers and support staff who are out and administrators who are out and then that further puts a strain and so what you what we've got here is not only a lot of quantitative data but also a lot of qualitative data if you were to ask our building principals how are you doing after four weeks of this they're going to tell you that they're very tired they're very stressed it's a lot on them and it's a lot on our staff right because we're asking teachers to internal sub we're asking them we know you were going to do this math testing today but now we need you to come over here we need you to do you know the instead of your reading we need you to come over here and that puts a classroom teacher in a tough spot because they're depending on that data and so as the numbers increase in the community you see that disruption um, in terms of our students the more students you have absence, now this is a, a, a really fortunate thing that we have this year in terms of having that remote option available. But it's not just, a, oh, you're out today and we'll, we'll put you in a new teacher, right? That takes time to set up. And so one of the disruptions that's factoring into our decision right now is the more those student absences increase, the more you have to start shifting kiddos around from one class to another. And that puts an uh, enormous strain on the system as well. And if you have close contacts outside of school in the same class, now you can really be uh, you know, in for it because you have a very, very tough situation. So in terms of student absences, on one hand, we have more options than we've ever had because we can put them in a remote setting. However, that transition from in-person to remote can be problematic when you're looking at, like today we had over 200 students absent that's a lot of kids to start putting in one model versus the other and that can cause a disruption. So that factors into our decision making as well. Does that answer the question, Greg? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Fine, thank you. So when we're looking at all these things and saying, okay, we believe we're at a substantial disruption to the educational process. This is why this adaptive pause is a great place to start and this is why you're gonna see many school districts. One of the most common threads that I hear from other superintendents when I ask them what is your biggest challenge staffing and attendance right that that's what we're dealing with I think school districts have done an amazing job implementing the safety procedures making sure that kids are six feet apart doing all of those things it's the other logistical challenges that really are posing the biggest problem here again I don't ever want to diminish safety or health uh, but the logistical issues behind in these high numbers are, are really causing a problem so again, going back to the model that we transitioned to, we had foresight, we predicted that perhaps we might be here, and that's why we pushed to get this model in place. And so Justin's gonna come now, and he's going to talk about what this model is going to look like when we hit the 16th through the 30th on those remote days. So as Dr. Russell's mentioned a couple of times, we, we really looked to the future knowing that a, tra a, a couple of these transitions were likely. And so this slide is actually a repeat of what was on one of our slides on September 28th. And I've just highlighted a couple of the things that we really are going to focus on tonight as we think about that fluidity of this model, that consistency that we desire to achieve, and recognizing the impact of changes. Not, none of the bullets on this slide are any less important than they were months ago, but these are the, the focal points as we go forward tonight. So on the next slide, we recognize that this was a significant transition to get from the model we opened the school year with to our hybrid model with a fully remote option. We are in the fourth week of this now, um, and, and we're seeing those routines and procedures established, and then we're beginning to hit our stride with this model, and, and in many cases, we have seen some, some definite early success. We are certainly focused on continuous improvement with any instructional model. And so some of the things that we recognize already as instructional benefits of the model we're in, we've alluded a couple times to the smaller class sizes at the elementary level. Obviously some of that is driven by available space, but even our remote classes are significantly smaller than typical class sizes in a typical school year. That balance of the way we're delivering the instruction, we don't, we don't lecture, we're not on all day for kids in a typical year, and so really looking to balance that synchronous and that live instructional time with the opportunities for some developmentally appropriate independent work. We've really had a chance to, once again, recreate schedules that allow for student support services to happen. That includes special education services, but also EL services, intervention services, all those different kinds of things that are now in place and up and running and for our students. 
Uh, Jane mentioned those synchronous specials have begun now where students in grades one through six are receiving weekly art, music, PE, and library classes. And we actually just very recently have added a bonus library for kindergarten students, something that would have been part of even our half day program years ago. And so that's happening um, as an opportunity for kindergarten students, students during asynchronous times or will be beginning very shortly. And again, we've talked about that flexibility of needing to be able to move between models with minimal impact. And that really is, we, we recognize and we, we heard and we, we acknowledge the impact of the transition that happened a few weeks ago. And we've said publicly and want to maintain, our goal is to not have to endure a transition of that magnitude in, in the near future as best we can help it. So as we move into this temporary shift, the structures in place with our current model will remain in place with any on-site instruction being replaced by live synchronous instruction via Zoom. And, and some of the benefits around that consistency, obviously it's that the time remains intact and the schedules remain very well intact. And so that ability to not see a, a tremendous shift in households in terms of recognizing the times of things and especially where we have multiple students where we've just gotten comfortable to the middle school times versus the elementary school times, those times will remain pr pretty much intact as we go through. We keep those smaller class sizes and so that you know at the elementary school now you know instead of on site in many cases it will be remote instruction but the the number of students remains smaller and i think that there's there's hardly a person who wouldn't say that the impact of two and a half or three hours of live instruction with eight to ten to twelve students is, is going to be stronger than even three and a half or four hours with 24 and 26 students you you, you have a, a much greater opportunity to individualize and look at the individual students in front of you and really make those connections with those smaller class sizes Again, it's the continuity of the student experiences. We won't see teacher changes as a result of the movement from uh, a hybrid model to a temporarily fully remote model. And again, it, it, it's, it's that, that knowing that we want to make sure that there is, there is a minimal impact for additional changes at, at this moment. That really is one, it, it is a, a significant benefit. You know, no model is perfect in, in a pandemic. And so we, we recognize that there are always going to be areas to keep improving. And so we'll look at some of those as we go forward here too. One of those areas that we've talked about is that asynchronous time. And we've talked about it here at board meetings before. This is something that we've wanted to continue to address and ensure that this is valuable and meaningful instructional time. And so one of the things we're working to ensure is that there is connection to synchronous instruction so that the asynchronous material by and large isn't simply drop in work, but it's connected to or an extension of the work that's happening in subject areas synchronously. The development of materials is something that is a, a, a tremendous undertaking, especially when you think about trying to find experiences for our first and second and third graders that truly can be accomplished with a level of relative independence. And so some of that's happening at the district level, some of that is happening at the building level or the individual teacher level. We had meetings with all of our teachers in grades uh, one, well actually K through six, last week and talk through what that experience was in terms of developing, assigning, and using the district-created asynchronous material. We've got some great feedback from our teachers that will help us to revise the district-created materials as we go forward. One of the things um, within that is thinking about rather than trying to ensure we're creating everything for science and social studies with the time we have, focusing on one or the other for a period of time. We've mentioned that before, but it, it, it's gained some traction with our teachers. We don't want to abandon either content area, but it, by emphasizing one for a few weeks and then another for a few weeks, it really helps us to ensure that the quality is, is matches the quantity that we would have. And as the students get older, some of that asynchronous work will resemble homework. You know, our, our second graders wouldn't typically have two hours worth of homework on a given night. But our seventh and eighth graders would have ex activities to complete that related to their classroom experiences. In a typical year, some of that might have been started in the classroom in a 47 minute period. And so now it, it just translates into that asynchronous time. The other piece we're, I'm sorry, I have one more. <laughs> yeah, the, Let me go back. <laughs> the other piece we're gonna continue to talk about are those essential standards. Obviously we set out essential standards for trimester one, and then with the way things worked out, trimester one was shortened significantly. So now we have a lengthier trimester two, and this is where we're going to take a look at the, the state priority standards that have been put out for guidance and talking with our grade level teachers and our middle school departments and really looking at, okay, how are we going to ensure now as we focus instruction going forward in, in throughout the next several weeks that we are identifying still the areas that we want to make sure we are focusing on with depth and recognizing that there are still pieces that we will need to 
let go of in some way or recognize that they will come back around either in trimester three or in a future moment. It's not to say we would, again, abandon any standards, but to realize that going off of that quote at the, at the bottom of that slide that, we've been, <laughs> that we have been repeating, we just have to continue to acknowledge that there's not an instructional model in a pandemic that doesn't require some sacrifice. And so our goal is to make those sacrifices deliberate and intentional so that we are on the flip side of that prioritizing the things that we want to be prioritizing. The other piece that uh, Dr. Russell mentioned earlier that I just want to spend a moment talking about is that idea of a temporary remote placement. So this is while we are in a hybrid instruction model, while there are students who are coming on site, but those students find themselves in a situation where they would be quarantining for an extended period, for a mandatory extended period of time. And, and in that case, once we've identified that it is going to be a longer period of time, we do try to keep students connected to live instruction. So at the middle school, most often that's really going to happen without much change of anything because they are interacting with the same teachers every other day synchronously, typically. And then there is that asynchronous work and the office hours that many teachers have provided. So that connection is, is relatively easy to maintain in the middle school structure. In the elementary structure, it is a little more challenging because we, we miss that live on-site portion of instruction. And so in that case, we do try to connect a student with a temporary remote classroom. Um, this is many times, there are some situations where it might be a teacher in your building or in, in certain very specific situations where it might be your same teacher who you know, has an afternoon remote section that you could have joined as an AM on-site student. But in many cases, this is a cross-building or cross-district placement where we are coordinating between multiple teachers to try to ensure that we're making connections and bringing that student into that synchronous learning. The reality is that it's, it's not going to replicate or match perfectly the experience that's happening in the on-site classroom. Our, we are doing a lot of work to keep our pacing very similar, but it, we, we won't ever necessarily match a day-to-day -day scenario, and, and every teacher's style is a little bit different. But the belief that we have is that if we can keep students connected to that live instruction as best we can during that time, it is beneficial, and, and it will outweigh that gap. Now, we are living this experience with our remote teachers now, and we're, we're having meetings with them and hearing feedback as to what's working well and what some of the challenges are. So it's something we will continue to evaluate. Obviously, as Dr. Russell mentioned, the quantity does have an impact on our ability to make these switches quickly, um, but it is something that we, we believe is important to offer in some way. And then just as a reminder on that last slide, this is one of those things that we absolutely want to offer for students who are in a mandatory, mandatory excuse me, COVID-based quarantine situation. This is something that uh, is, is based on that, and so that's where we would access for those elementary students a temporary placement. So to kind of conclude the superintendent's report, um, moving forward, again, we're advocating for this two-week adaptive pause starting on the 16th. In the event this would need to be extended, our goal would be to notify families on November 23rd. Um, every Monday I meet with the health department, we, we talk, and in the event things aren't turning around in terms of we're not able to solve our logistical challenges, um, we would feel comfortable being able to communicate that out. Again, we're making the assumption that we are going to be able to come back. Um, and if we're not able to do that, then we would go ahead and try and give our families at least one week's notice. Now, I always say that with a caveat because sometimes you don't know what you don't know in terms of a decision from the state or something that could take place. But again, our goal, as um, you know, we, we showed today, is to give our families a one week notice. I don't mean to lecture our community. I mean what I'm about to say to really ask our community for help. The behavior that we exhibit as parents, as students, as staff, is going to be essential in whether or not we're able to open our schools. I think we've all seen what is taking place, not only in Downers Grove, but throughout our state, where people are still gathering in groups. People believe that this can't impact them. Um, it can, and it will. And that has a direct impact on whether or not we're able to open our schools. And so I'm asking the community, clearly the overwhelming majority of our parents advocated for in-person instruction. This is something our community really wants. And in order to do this, we have to make sure that we're making really good decisions. And sometimes those good decisions are tough decisions, especially with Thanksgiving in the holidays and all those. But we are very concerned 
across all school districts what Thanksgiving and some of the holidays in December could bring to us unless people change their behavior. And that is going to impact whether or not we're able to do what we intend to do, and that's to come back for in-person instruction. We're all in this together, but it is certainly going to take a strong community effort for us to be able to do this successfully um, throughout the winter months. So again, over the next several weeks, we are going to closely examine staffing, student absences, look at everything up, down, top, bottom. Now, someone could be listening to this and saying, well, why haven't you done all that already, right? Um, again, I want to really be upfront with the community. This is a 24-7 job, keeping track of COVID when you have in-person instruction. It is literally taking every moment that we have to do these things. This pause will allow us time to really focus in on those things that, quite frankly, we haven't been able to get to because we've been doing all of this. Again, as uh, Jane said, actively recruiting, training in additional substitute teachers. Uh, and we also have a lot of other work that we need to get caught up on. Things that would be big deals in normal years have been kind of pushed to the side. Uh, that work still has to get done in our school district. And, and so that is what moving forward will look like. Again, I wanna thank our parents. I wanna thank our staff for their flexibility. Um, none of us ever wanna do an adaptive pause. I'll be the first one in line for that. Um, but when you hit a certain point, you have to recognize that we need a community effort, a couple of really good strong weeks of social distancing, following the guidelines, we'll be able to come back on the 30th if we meet that criteria. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Um, can we, we have some questions? Can we ask, can yeah. I ask a question? Absolutely. And then um, I'll have any of the assistants if there's a, a specialty question for them. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you um, so much for spelling this out um, and getting into the nitty gritty. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask, I understand that you're talking about having this go through November 30th, and I forget what the date of Thanksgiving is, but I think it's just a couple days after Thanksgiving, uh, the 30th, that, that would be the Monday after Thanksgiving. Is there, um, is there a rationale that, that you pick that date instead of having it go a little bit past Thanksgiving? Yeah. Because of the nature of what everyone's talking about, of people getting together with grandma and grandpa? So a couple things uh, to that. I would ask um, that people make really good decisions over Thanksgiving, especially with some of our elder relatives. I don't want to lecture the community. Uh, however, what I'm presenting to you tonight is a logistical challenge mainly due to not being able to fully staff our buildings. And that's through no fault of anyone for getting sick. Um, that's three weeks from today. The mandatory quarantine times are 10 days or 14 days. If we do this right, the 16th of the 30th meets that threshold. Um, so again, um, what I don't want to do is to come here today and say, you know what, we're not going to give our community the benefit of the doubt. We're, we're just going to predict. If this has taught me anything is that you can't make predictions more than two or three weeks at a time. That's where we're at right now. And that's why we said the 30th because we very much want to come back on the 30th. Um, you'll see several other districts that have done the same thing. So for instance, Lockport just did it, um, Lamont just did it, and they're all targeting the 30th because they need time to get caught up on their staffing, which is exactly why we set the 30th as our threshold. If we can't meet that, we'll come back to the Board of Education and explain the why and share that with our community. So the community, the, the, the numbers of the community spread that we, we speak of, mm -hmm. it's, it's more about the kids that are out um, waiting or the staff that are out waiting to it's probably a, it could be a cold or whatever but trying to staff it it has nothing to do with the, how many the number of positive the positivity rate correct yeah so the positivity rate um, or is it in, in kind of related and again I want to be careful um, I, th I think what because I am certainly not an epidemiologist and when you start looking at percentages and in all of that the positive or the positivity rate has a correlation between um, the cases per day those cases per day have a correlation uh, between our absences and um, so what we're seeing right now um, 
and again, there are districts out there that have been remote for a very long time that have much higher positivity rates than, than, than we do right now. So going remote doesn't solve your positivity rate. That's what I wanted to yeah. get. Sorry, <laughs> it, I no. was working around to it, what I was trying to say. It certainly doesn't because if you just look, most school districts started off in remote learning. And the numbers continue to get worse and worse, right? Uh, and so I, I don't want anybody to think that remote learning is all of a sudden a cure for, for the positivity rate or, or cases per day. Behavior is, is the cure for that. But what we're seeing is it's not necessarily whether or not um, you know, the, the positivity rate is here or there. A lot of what we're dealing with is our staff are strictly adhering to the guidelines. So if you have a child at home that has one of the many symptoms of COVID-19, until they get a test, until they get an alternate diagnosis, you have to quarantine because you are a suspected close contact. And if testing takes a while, you could be out for 14 days. If you're notified that you were a close contact, you're out for 14 days and a negative test won't clear you. So a lot of this backlog are potentially people that will never test positive, but because they're adhering to all of the restrictions, when you're a close contact, that is, you're, you're out for a very long time. And then of course, if you are symptomatic or you are positive, you're out for 10 days. And, and so these things start to build up on each other. That, the reason I asked was I was looking at other districts that have been remote this whole time and using the Northwestern tracker. And schools that have been remote have the same percentage of positivity or higher. So having school or not school, it, it was still indicative of there, there's still a high percentage of positivity whether school is open or not. So mm -hmm. this really boils down to everyone needs to follow the three rules <laughs> of social distance and all that for going into the holidays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was my I mean, the rate jump seems to have more to do with the weather, right? And everybody moving inside. I don't, I don't know what else. it is, but yeah. all the districts that I looked at around us that have been closed, their positivity rates are higher than ours. And, and so it's like, I, I'm. I know there's been some, some talk in terms of what are we looking at in terms of that zip code tracker? Because if you look at District 58, there are many slivers. Like we have a sliver of Woodridge, we have a sliver of Westmont, we have a big chunk of Oak Brook, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll have people ask, well, did you include Oak Brook in your number? Why didn't you include Woodridge? You're, I, I, what I do is I take the two Downers Grove zip codes, 60515 and 60516. There are no secrets behind this at all. We're not trying to include communities that have better numbers or communities that may have worse numbers. We're looking at what are the two complete zip codes for the majority of our school district. That's what we're looking at. Now we're not ignoring the data in these surrounding towns because obviously not everyone who works here lives here. And, and we do have students who live in Woodridge or Westmont or Oak Brook. It's just those slivers don't make up the comprehensive area like 60515 and 60516 do when we're looking at the data. Okay, thank you very much. I guess I just want to thank you as, as one board member. I think uh, the administration's really thinking through this in a pragmatic way. I think, you know, ideals sometimes uh, cloud people's judgment, but I think um, the reality that we, we find ourselves in as a community, I think the administration's done an excellent job thinking through all the, the considerations, so, so thank you. Yeah, no, we, we certainly appreciate it. And the one thing I, I, I just want to stress to our community, sometimes I'll get a communication with, um, aren't you worried or, or, or don't you care about children or the staff? Uh, I, I want to push back on that so hard. That's all that we care about are our students, our families, and our staff members. We spend nights, weekends worrying about all this, trying to figure this all out. We would never intentionally put anyone in harm's way uh, during this pandemic. Um, we are working very closely with neighboring districts, the health department, trying to make the most informed decisions, but certainly there are strong feelings on all sides of the school reopening issue. But I can assure you, we approach everything with a safety first lens. Thank you so much for your blood, sweat, and tears. Because I on, on the, our website, I, I will say that in looking around other districts, we report and are very open about everything with all the letters, the dashboard. And if you go looking up and down the dial of uh, the neighboring districts, they do not do it to the same caliber we do. Again, I, I'm never going to say we're a perfect school district or that we've got to figure it out. We make mistakes like everyone else. We are not perfect. But I am very proud of the transparency that we're offering our community in terms of what we're dealing with and, and trying to give them the same access to information that we have. Thank you for your hard work.
I just wanted to, um, just with all the information that has that you guys have been doing and, and listening to um, Matt and Haley's presentation, um, just a big, you know, a big shout out to staff. I know this has been extremely difficult. Um, I know that they've been working very hard, um, but my daughter is, you know, she's had changes of teachers, um, and it, she's not at all thrilled that um, we are going to be going, staying at home for two weeks middle school. I think they're thrilled that they get to get away from us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do know that uh, her teachers are going to be just as positive next week and the week after that um, and keep these kids where they need to be. I, you know, I just can't thank them enough for, um, you know, personally, for my own family, I just, it's, this has been extremely difficult and I know that every single family is struggling with the new numbers going up, um, but we do appreciate it. We do know that it's hard um, and we do know that the kids love you to death and um, I just know that my daughter is still getting top-notch instruction from uh, the teachers, instructional assistants, and admin. So I just wanted to say thank you to all those teachers out there. I can't tell you, uh, you know, how, Jill, just to echo what you're saying, um, when you look at the teaching profession, the support staff uh, profession, what they've been asked to do since March and what they continue to be asked to do over and over again. Uh, I know we have uh, some members of our association in the audience. Uh, they become like, uh, I think we need to give an office at the admin center because they're there all the time talking with us. Um, our principal's the same way. Um, you know, uh, again, we may not always get everything perfect, but the work ethic of, of the staff has been second to none. I would definitely echo what, what Jill said about the um, teachers and just their, their level of commitment throughout all this process. And I know that it's definitely not going to change. I have a glimpse into three different schools and various levels of programming for different uh, needs of students and things like that and, and it is across the board um, astonishing the level of effort that these teachers are putting in right now um, whether it's you know responding to emails from parents um, staying a couple minutes after their morning or their or afternoon session to help a kid out with something all those types of things it's it's pretty amazing to see you know you try to look for positives in this situation and that's definitely one that I've I've found that just the community kind of coming together and, and same thing for, for families and parents uh, Kevin you kind of touched on this that especially um, parents and families whose, whose students have shown symptoms or been a close content and have um, gone the extra mile to make sure that they followed the protocols and kept everybody safe and prevented some of those you know major outbreaks that we were worried about at, at a time and we haven't seen that come to fruition and I think that is a lot of a lot of that is due to the dedication of families to really follow those protocols along the lines, and I think that's awesome. Um, I have a couple quick questions about um, what we're gonna, what's gonna look like going forward. In terms of the actual like day-to-day -day schedule when we go to this pause of and back to remote, is it going to be more like um, the current model where they're gonna still have, like students will still have either their AM or PM synchronous consecutive two and a half hours, and then consecutive asynchronous time or is it going to look more similar to August September where it was a more fluid throughout the day or are we still working on that? No, no, that, that's a great question and it is going to look like it does right now okay. um, and a, a good glimpse into what this is going to look like for all of our students is what it looks like for our remote only students uh, right now. Okay. Um, Again, we're not getting rid of our synchronous special times at this particular time. We're making sure that we keep those reading and math intervention supports in place. Um, and, and we're looking at, again, how do we continue to beef up that asynchronous time? But the schedule will look exactly like it does now, uh, and that's why we moved to this model. I know uh, there could be a tendency for people to say, well, just combine both classes, and then, and then you can be on Zoom all day long. Um, we can't. And the reason why we can't is not everybody has that perfect AM, PM mix, right? Some teachers are teaching AM in one school, and then they may have a remote group that is comprised of three or four other schools. So those kids just can't necessarily always uh, be combined. And, and, and then you wouldn't be able to do your synchronous special schedule, and you wouldn't be able to do all of those um, supports. But again, one of the other points I want to emphasize, and, and I'm speaking elementary right now, um, the, the groups are so small. 
Um, and, and as a former teacher, I can tell you this. Um, if you give me 10 kids for, for two and a half or three hours on Zoom versus 25 on, on three or four hours of Zoom, I can probably get a lot more done with, with that smaller group. And so, again, the schedule is going to stay the way it is. Did you have another question? No. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 I was waiting. I was waiting. <laughs> Well, then I guess in, in closing, I, I did want to say a couple things, and one of them is um, leadership is significantly more difficult when there isn't a, a single metric or, or whatever that, that makes the, the decision for you. When you're working in the gray and you have to take all of these things and try to compile to decide what's best for our staff and for our students and for our families, it's much more difficult in measuring that and dealing with it is hard, and I know that when it is gray, um, we field a lot more questions when, when, we, when we live in the gray as when we live in the black and white. And you mentioned in, in sort of your intro to uh, school board member day uh, about how, how, how difficult it is during this time. And when you make a decision, uh, you're just going to have just as many people unhappy or happy, depending on which, which side of the coin we ended up on. And so uh, I want to thank, thank you and your entire team for, for the leadership in this and doing all the computation on trying to make the logistics work. If, if it wasn't for the hard work of, of your team and the building leadership, this wouldn't be possible. It also wouldn't be possible if we did not have a willingness of our teachers and staff to be creative and adjust and adapt. So I, I really thank them as well. Our staff, it's really important to know how seen they are right now. Um, I, I have the opportunity to either do drop off or pick up most days of the week. And they're just so present in there. And whether it's our teachers or custodians and specialists and support staff, uh, you know, everybody, the clerical staff, I mean, I, I just see them, just like I was telling the principals early, putting on any hat that they need to put on and adjust to this. So uh, I'm disappointed that we have to move in, into this situation. Uh, we were hoping that we would not have any kind of logistical fires. I'm glad that we're not a super spreader location, that we're not necessarily a a point of, of real safety concerns. At the same time, I do recognize the fact that we have a challenge. So, you know, thank you for finding a, a plan. I, I, it is a reminder to everybody to, to, while we're out, even though it's gonna be Thanksgiving, remember the three W's and, and keep that distance and, and, let's, and let's get ourselves into a better place logistically so that we can come back on the 30th, step in the building and uh, continue the learning. I got the, we've talked about it before, but it's still just, it's still right now, such a great energy around the buildings and um, uh, it's so nice to see, so mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you guys, Thank everybody, you. for your hard work. I greatly appreciate it. Todd. Troy Fall. The monthly business and the treasurer's report. <clears throat> it can be uh, really quick. Um, year to date is as it is as written. Um, we're in a good position. Uh, revenue over expenses right now. Uh, part of that is a transportation piece, and you'll see on your bill list uh, this evening uh, a catch up from uh, the uh, contract amendments that the board approved last month uh, with our two large transportation firms. Um, those uh, are, are on the bill. Uh, even with that piece, we're still going to be trailing behind a bit uh, where we were year to date from last year. Um, revenue is up. I will tell you that you will see a dip uh, next month uh, because we are processing uh, in the ne next few days, um, <laughs> making sure. Um, uh, any rebates of fees that of programs that won't be going on, uh, mainly the outdoor fee and some milk fund and so forth. So those will be going back to parents, and so you'll see that adjustment uh, next month in the in the November bills. Um, other than that, we're in a good position and and ahead of where we were last year. Uh, you have one thing I wanted uh, wanted to point out in the um, action items, and that is mechanical. Uh, engineering uh, proposal. 
when in, we're reviewing the roof work, uh, one of those things that pierce down are those uh, units on the top, the roof units are 35, 30 plus years old. Uh, it would not make any sense to take them off, do the roof and put a 30-year-old roof unit back on there, knowing that we'll be up there shortly to replace it. Um, normally under this format, the mechanical engineer would be just a subcontractor under the roofing contract. We're looking at some other opportunities that have some uh, grant funds and some energy efficiency pieces uh, throughout the district, uh, namely some boilers and some other areas. So it makes sense to then take that mechanical engineering contract and pull it aside and ask for approval for that, knowing that that is something that will be part of the roofing piece but also have some additional work. So it's a light month for us this month. Are there any besides the health and, health and, health and wellness, which uh, Mr. Harris uh, can speak to and, and uh, Mr. Hughes and Mr. Olchek can talk about the FAC meeting that was on this week, this last week. Question on the HVAC uh, at Pierce Downer. What's the expected cost that we should expect when the, uh, on the evaluation is uh, done? On those two units? Oh, I don't know how much. Do we have an, I don't know. We have an estimate on what the, the, the rooftops. It's not, a, it's not a huge piece of that contract, um, and that's why it would have just been a sub piece. So, but we can get those. We can look that up and get you too. The the other pieces, the boilers that we're looking at, and some of those others are the more larger pieces of the project. And we're hoping to get there's there's grant money and rebate money available through ComEd and and NICOR and and that that helps fund some of those upgrades, including maybe some lighting that we might be able to do something that can save us some operational dollars on a, on a yearly basis. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the policy committee did not meet in October, but the legislative committee did on October 21st. So, Member Doshi? Yeah, I'll uh, kick us off. Uh, so, in November, on November 14th, the delegate assembly will convene. Uh, there are 12 resolutions and proposals or statements that are up for a vote. Um, and each school district board of education in the state will submit one vote towards our lobbying group, the IASB, on how, to, how they should advocate or not advocate on our behalf. Um, so uh, in your packet, you each had the proposals in addition to the legislative committee's recommendation. Um, just for the public's uh, benefit, there were a wide range of proposals this year from a statewide, statewide run loan program for school districts for short-term funding, uh, to uh, the releases of school report cards, to teacher licensure, um, e-learning days on election days, uh, who controls what, what happens with school districts openings or closings during a, during a pandemic, as if that would ever happen. <laughs> um, charter school funding, these are particularly for school, uh, um, districts where the state requires that a charter school be uh, started, uh, typically due to uh, poor performance of the school district itself. Uh, who has uh, say and control over what those charter schools uh, how they operate, what, uh, what services they provide to students, and whether their contract gets renewed. Uh, and then finally, a equity belief statement around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So a wide-ranging uh, list of topics. Uh, the way that we're going to approach it tonight, just so everybody has it, is uh, this is all part of the consent agenda today. And so um, the recommendations from the Legislative Committee are currently on the consent agenda. Uh, we're welcome to have a discussion right now on any particular areas where there are either clarifying questions or a point to be made. Um, but during the consent agenda, if there is a particular proposal or uh, yeah, proposal where you don't necessarily agree or you want to pull that out, regardless of whether you agree or not, you want to pull that out as a separate vote, that's the way we'll handle it. There will not be 12 items to vote on this time, which is how, which is how I think we did it either one or two years ago. So uh, I think uh, this will be a bit more efficient. 
Um, or this might be how I thought we would do it two, one or two years ago, and I'm glad that I think Melissa stepped in and said that's probably a bad idea. Um, so uh, we'll do it this way on the consent agenda. But let's pause. Let me pause there, Emily. If there's anything that you'd like to add before we uh, open it up for the group for a discussion. I don't know another yeah. Yeah, I guess the only question I have is, I, I think last year when we went through this, you kind of just highlighted the ones that received like more discussion than others. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was very well documented. It's pretty straightforward. I was just curious as were there ones that yeah. generated more dialogue than others? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll name probably two. And uh, Emily, feel free to chime in if there's something that I'm missing. Mm -hmm. Number four on pre-K teacher licensure. This one's really focused on um, requiring a certain level of literacy education for those that are pursuing an education major in college. Uh, right now, there are requirements around literacy, literacy uh, training, but uh, the resolution also points out, or the proposing school district points out, that uh, the state of Illinois falls behind on literacy levels, as do we as a, as a nation. Uh, and so uh, should we be holding a higher standard on uh, the science behind teaching literacy as it being a requirement before teaching pre-K. Uh, so that was proposal number four, or resolution number four. Um, the resolutions committee, not us, not our committee, but the IESB's committee, suggested that they oppose this resolution to not require higher levels of literacy training. Uh, primarily the reason for that was uh, it is already difficult to staff school districts with t uh, qualified teaching, uh, qualified teachers uh, across the state. And um, the IESB also does not advocate for getting involved in the credentialing of educators. That's on school districts to set their requirements on who they will hire uh, and education institutions should that, or uh, higher education institutions should then follow to make sure their students are meeting the market demand. Uh, that's the position they took. Uh, the legislative committee discussed this at length and ultimately opposed that and suggested that we do have higher standards for literacy training. Um, so that was one. Um, the other one was around e-learning election day. So as everybody knew, this past Tuesday, uh, statewide schools were out due to the general election. However, on future, especially uh, off-cycle elections or on primary days, uh, schools are in session on those days. and. Uh, now that we've gotten a taste of how we can do e-learning and have been able to prove that it is largely something that we can execute if needed, um, the proposal was to make election days into e-learning days as opposed to taking either a day off of school, which is currently not the case, or to have community members coming in and out of a building when students are in seat and in session, causing a disruption to the day's normal procedures. and so. Um, those are two that came up that I thought were particularly of, of note. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything you would add? The only one I would add to the Brad, just a little bit, was number five, the teacher shortage one, um, where the resolution, the, the district who's proposing this resolution is, is asking sort of that, um, again, because of teacher shortages across the state, particularly, especially so in southern parts of the state and things like that um, where shortages are even much more substantial that provisional license be extended to teachers who maybe they don't have a actual teaching certificate but they have some experience in a given subject area they'd be allowed to teach for a certain number of years while obtaining that license etc things like that um, we as a as a legislative committee for for the district decided to not adopt um, the isb's IASB's recommendation for that, and mostly it was because it was too broad. We felt that there were areas where that could potentially be appropriate, but certain areas such as special education, for example, or you know, areas particularly where that um, like really specific level of teacher training would be absolutely essential. And those areas, we just felt like it was it was the the right the language of the resolution was too broad, and that we couldn't get behind the idea of, of adopting provisional licensure for just any given subject area where there was happened to be a shortage because there were just some areas where the specifics of what that that educational methodology was just too important to sacrifice so that was the only other one that i felt like was was kind of one that we spent a little bit of time on so regarding that um i'm looking at that was number that was number five five, five. Mm -hmm. okay so um 
my questions around these resolutions mostly um, are centered on the distinctions made on this on this chart here that I'm I'm really appreciative of having uh, nice and nice and easy for me so um, I can see it right there. There are three where um, we go against the mm -hmm. advice of the IASB mm -hmm. and um, Karat, I think you uh, you did a helpful job for me in explaining for number. Um, for why we are going against IASB. Um, can do you, either of you have some insight in terms of why IASB is suggesting that, um, why, they, why they are saying we should not adopt this resolution? Which one? This is, now I'm talking about number, but no, they're saying why they think we should adopt it, and our legislative committee is saying we should not adopt it, number five. Mm -hmm. Talk to me, help me um, understand the difference in positions between IASB and um, our legislative committee. I, th I mean, I think particularly for number five, I think the, from what I could understand from the language, the, the reason the IASB was supporting number five was just because of the shortages and filling those spaces. Um, they felt that filling those spaces was valuable enough to sacrifice the, the licensure required and while we could see that being workable in some instances, not in every instance. And if we couldn't support it in every instance, we couldn't support it overall. Does that make sense? It, I, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. I, I, I think guess. they're just looking, they're thinking solely on let's, let's try to reduce that teacher shortage across the state, particularly in Southern Illinois where it's so much more substantial. And I like the point you made, Emily, about um, certain programs, like say yes. special education. Right. Um, did you get the indication, um, due to your extensive knowledge of this, which is far greater than mine, that um, the school districts are allowing, are pushing this to um, lower the bar, as it were, for, say, special ed specifically, or do you think it's more for? I, mean, I guess I don't need to be hard to to drop to paint in generalities. But the like, resolution committee does speak to it, so they do say that the submitting district was asking for due to physical physical education foreign language and, and special, special education. education. Yeah, I see right there. Okay. And so those are the three years that they were seeing shortages that they needed support on. I guess that's a um, but that was the, I would say among those, possibly all three of those are areas where there is a specialized training needed to be able to teach those subjects. Sure. And we felt as a committee, we weren't willing to, to bend the bar for those areas, especially in areas where students, particularly in special education, where students yeah, I need mean, specialized support. Thank, thank you both, and this is really helpful. I, I appreciate um, your insight. Um, I, I came with the question of, especially this, num this number five in particular, wanting to know more about um, the, the committee's thinking. Um, and it's just, it's just my belief, and we've talked about this as a board many times, as long as we've been doing this, um, that we kind of support local control, that we believe that we as a district can hold ourselves to the standard that we feel is most important based on our values as a community, as enforced by represent is elected by the community, but who are we to um, point to some school district in, in you know, southern Illinois and say you have to do it our way. Um, but um, I, I, I can't disagree with you. I mean, the whole, those, those areas, in terms, especially special education, saying that, um, that we should, I guess, water down the requirements for being a special education teacher, I, I, you've changed my mind, so thank you. Would it be the first time? Would it be the last? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I do have one question around that because because uh, I kind of came into it similar to you, uh, Greg. Is um, the IASB is obviously recommending that we adopt them? Now it's it's important to recognize that this is a giving them permission to lobby on behalf of something. There's no bill yet that, that right. so obviously there's an opportunity to refine that and tighten that. I guess uh, what I just want to make sure of is when we talk about local control and those kind of things that, is that we're not taking a step here that does more harm than good because it's either a choice between getting someone in their provisional, allow them to get some training and become a permanent teacher in there or have an absence of somebody. So do you, obviously they're pushing this and I think that's where I'm just, I just want to make sure that I'm not supporting something, just because we wouldn't support something here in this town, that we're not doing something that's impacting somebody in a real negative, it, not, not that, I, I guess I'm curious too, do you know how often 
something gets lobbied for, and that actually becomes a bill on the floor, that, and then how often the bill on the floor actually becomes... Uh, I would say it's pretty Pretty rare. low, right? So it's I think that's why we've always lot. relatively been kind of quick on, on these resolutions to begin with, but I just want to make sure that, that I'm not hurting another district just because we have a slightly different standard here as an affluent suburb of Chicago. I, I wouldn't interpret it as hurting another district in this particular case. Um, but I, I do want to point out, um, when you're hearing, and, and this is nothing against physical education teachers, but when I was going through my training, there were two things they warned us about. If you become a physical education teacher or social studies teacher like I was, good luck finding a job because there's a million of you. And just to show how far we've come in a state in 25 years, um, now physical education teachers, social studies teachers are now part of the shortage. So the shortage is real. Um, there are still provisions for things like long-term substitutes if somebody has a substitute position where you could still fill that position. What this is really talking about is are you able to get a quicker path to a teaching certificate, but it doesn't limit a school district from being able to fill that position temporarily with a long-term substitute teacher. Okay. And sometimes these provisional licenses can, be, can last five years. So yeah, you're talking about five years of someone who isn't really highly qualified to teach in that position, having that position, it's five years of students going through and five, you know, I mean, there's potential, I, I also, and this is kind of another issue and a whole other discussion, but I argue that the teacher shortage probably isn't necessarily due to the fact that it's too hard to become a teacher. You know, the teacher shortage is due to a lot of other issues that it's so difficult to become a teacher, it's not that difficult, it's, you know. There's a lot of other reasons why there's a teacher shortage, and that's probably not the main one. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we weren't issue to argue, but yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure we weren't advocating basically for rolling subs instead of you know a, a provisional license that yeah. eventually you know got to a stronger to place a, and became a permanent could position. Be to a great teacher. I, you know, I, I'm just trying to make sure that we're uh, the way that I suggest thinking yeah. about this is not so much the like advocating or not advocating. I think what we're suggesting here is. There is a systemic challenge in how we treat our teachers across the state, across the country, and incentivizing more individuals to want to get into these positions in a way that's not making the job excessively difficult and finding fast tracks at the last minute to be able to get these folks into positions. I think this is a shortcut solution that seems like a shortcut solution. Okay. And so I would advocate for, there's a systemic problem here around why we have teacher shortages. Um, this would be a short-term fix. I don't think a short-term fix should be law. That's just, that's my opinion as an individual board member. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, great. Thank you. Uh, the Financial uh, Advisory Committee met as well on, on over November 6th. Um, a couple things to note. We are adjusting the FAC to meet monthly and that will continue to, to meet the Friday prior to a board meeting. And we do that, it's a good opportunity for just a kind of a last minute look at, at the year's date and, and some of the other information that's gonna be presented to the board. But one of the reasons why we wanna move monthly is with all the ongoing issues that we're battling, obviously we're, we're battling a heck of a deficit this year because how we, kick off, how we kicked off the year. We really wanna spend our time dialoguing with the members uh, on the committee. These people are engaged members of our community as well as very financially savvy. So it, it's a great opportunity for us to start bouncing ideas of potential impacts on something or financial savings we could do somewhere. Uh, so that's really where we, we, we see the value that's gonna come out of the FAC. We spent a lot of time talking about sort of the risks that we have going into next year, the potential losses in state revenue. Um, obviously, we did not move forward with the graduated income tax. Um, right now, they're telling us that they're holding us harmless, but just because they promise us some money until that check clears, they might say, hey, we're going to prorate that at a, a certain percentage or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, so we just need to be, uh, we just need to be very careful about how we're looking, looking at our state funds. We, we spent a lot of time talking about our, our capital issues, some of the stuff that we've been talking about here. and. That Pierce roof obviously is already having structural failures, and we have 30-year-old equipment on the roof. And what is that boiler? 70 years old? 65? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 70-year-old boiler. Um, 
So we have some real systemic problems in our building, and, and how do we deal with that? How do we look at bond issuances and the impact that that has on us? Because really, um, our, our, our ability to have non-referendum debt is very limited. So, so that's just a challenge, and we just got to make sure we were looking at the impact and what we would need to potentially borrow now to be able to do that. Um, and what does that mean over the next three or four years? And, um, and, and what we can pay out per year. So we're having a lot of really good dialogue on that. And we focused on three things, short-term solutions, mid-term solutions, and long-term solutions. So the short-term solutions is we might have to have some really tough conversations around uh, staff and, and class size and, and, um, and, and stuff along those things. Like a mid-term solution would be uh, Longfellow. You know, can we get that off of our books? Can we do something there, get some revenue in? bring some expense down. And then our long-term solution is ultimately going to be to get back to that uh, master's facility plan. And, but does that conversation look the same as it looked before? Do we need, you know, is there going to be a phase one of that that maybe talks about reutilization of buildings and boundary changes? I mean, those kind of things may have to be, uh, have to be talked about here uh, as we start putting some new um, long-term plans together. We may want to talk about uh, uh, re-looking at the, at the referendum. So it, as soon as we get to a point where we can kind of settle down a little bit, that, that, that Dr. Russell and I don't have several phone calls a day regarding COVID <laughs> symptoms and, and numbers and, and, and all of those kind of things, maybe we can get, uh, the hope is to get back into getting that, that community um, group together uh, to work on that. So the role of this going forward is to really start looking at um, the impacts that we're going to have in making decisions going forward because uh, th there are concerns uh, about revenue coming in. Now, maybe we don't get a lot of money from the state, but as we learned from O'Keefe, one million dollars has an incredible impact on, on our district, even if that's only a small part of our budget. Uh, and little things are going to impact us. We get reimbursed from the state for busing, but that's paid in arrears. So this year, we're doing a little bit better because we're getting paid ba based on the, the busing that we got last year. Next year, we're going to get paid on, on busing we use this year, which is signi significantly lower. So as our costs go back up for, for transportation, the check that we get from the state is going to go down. So um, we're going to continue to have a lot of dialogue on, on ways to, to both save money and potentially find new revenue and things along those lines going forward. Uh, Steve, I will yield over to you oh, and as always excellent uh, <laughs> summary of, of the discussion I think uh, you know we, we definitely have a high level of engagement and and a desire to move some of those conversations into action and I think um, we definitely need to harness that and so I, I think you know the monthly frequency of which we'll be meeting is, is key to really take to the next level I you know we were in a triage situation with everything and continue to be in a triage situation but um, I think we all see the, the reality of our financial situation. We need to start making those tough decisions uh, sooner than later. With that, we'll open up to any questions. All right, thank you. The district leadership team did not meet, but the health and wellness committee did on November 5th. And it was a short meeting. Uh, the shortest, I think, by about an hour, Todd, what do you say? <laughs> um, so we looked over our September data. Our revenue was slightly under expenditures for September, but fear not, this is, we are still um, way be in a way better position than we were uh, a year ago. Um, as, at, again, looking at September's, September's data, with still three more uh, months than the year left, we had um, a surplus of about $1.4 million. So um, again, one, one thing to be positive about. Um, the. Uh, the rest of the agenda on the, was to talk about uh, a couple other items. We had, um, this year we had about 340 individuals participate in our wellness screening, which if you recall, um, I don't know exactly when that was, but it was approximately a year ago we had some conversations as a board about how to uh, better incentivize our members to take advantage of, of these processes, with the idea being if we, put, if we create this investment up front, in the back end we're going to um, find ourselves with healthier members, which is going to lower our costs for say, diabetes and things like that. So um, we had greater, much greater participation, about 70 to 80 individuals over this time last year. And finally, it is open enrollment and our, our offices worked um, uh, to set up some sessions for our members to participate in to uh, get them as much information as they possibly can to help them make informed decisions about their healthcare needs for uh, as of January 1st. 
Any questions? All right. Thank you. All right, we have no open discussion items today, so that takes us on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended for a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allocated 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Have we received any cards? No. We do not have any cards, so do we have any voice, and we have no voicemails left. So then I'll open it to the floor. Is there anyone that would like to make a public comment from the gallery today? I find it's hard to believe. <laughs> Making it easy on me. All right. Okay, then we'll go ahead and move on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? Fantastic. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from October 14th, 2020 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Han uh, sorry. Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Samanti? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 14th, 2020 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the October 26, 2020 curriculum workshop as presented? So moved. Second. Okay, uh, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. Member Harris? Aye. Member Olchik? Aye. Member Samanti? Aye. Member Hughes? Aye. Motion carried to approve the minutes of the October 26, 2020 curriculum workshop as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items board members would like to have considered separately? So you are talking about items A, That would B, also include any of the resolutions. A, B, and C. A, B, and C. A, B, and C all together, okay. Yeah. Anything? Nope. All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report, financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary, and the IASB resolutions as presented in the packet of materials. So moved. Second. All right. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We do not have any recommendation for board action for the return to learn plan, so we'll go to the 2020 American Education Week resolution. Um, next week is American Education Week, which presents us with an opportunity to celebrate public education and honor those making a difference to ensure every student receives a quality education. Is there a motion to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried uh, to, to adopt the American Education Week resolution as presented. Now that it has been passed, I will go ahead and read this. Uh, it states, whereas the public schools are an important and integral part of our society, and whereas the concept of a free and equal education is an American tradition, and this country's strength, and whereas the students of today are the leaders of tomorrow, and whereas the citizens have a responsibility to support the public schools, now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District 58, DuPage County, Illinois, hereby proclaim November 16th through 20th, 2020, American Education Week, and urge all citizens to make a commitment to public education and to the future of our community, state, and nation by visiting their local public schools and by donating their time and talents to help make our public schools even better. Dated this day, the ninth day of November, 2020. It may not be the best time to go visit them personally, <laughs> but the sentiment is the same nonetheless. Just bring your calendar for later. All right, next up we have the 2020 Certificate of Levy. Is there a motion to adopt the 2020 Certificate of Levy in the amount of Sixty million one hundred ninety-five thousand. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? 
All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Olczyk. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the 2020 certificate of levy in the amount of 60,195,000. We have some surplus equipment. Is there a motion to designate a bandsaw and a John Deere 525 tractor as surplus equipment? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate a bandsaw and the John Deere 525 tractor as surplus equipment. Um, we have an engineering services proposal for Pierce Downer mechanical equipment. Is there a motion to accept the engineering proposal for, from CS2 Engineering as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to accept the engineering proposal from CS2 Engineering as presented. I have a couple of announcements tonight. Wednesday, November 11th at 3.45 p.m. will be the Legislative Committee meeting. On the, um, at the ASC and over Zoom. Tuesday, November 17th at 7 a.m. will be the Policy Committee at the ASC and over Zoom. Monday, December 7th at 7 a.m. will be our District Leadership Team meeting, which will take place at Bel Air. It'll most likely be at, at Herrick. Okay. And Monday, December 7th, 7 p.m. will also be our Financial Workshop will also take place at Herrick. All right, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? 5 ILCS 122 C1. The placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters related to individual students. 5 ILCS 122 C10. And the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Opening Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes is mandated by Section 2.06. It's 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet up at 9, 10 p.m. Let me go space. Let's have fun here. Is it not supposed to This is a serious meeting. The board has now returned to open session here at 9.33 p.m. Uh, we have one action as a result of closed. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from October 14, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of its contents? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please? Oh, I'll do it. All right. <laughs> Dr. Russell, will you please call roll? Member Weiner? Aye. Member Olchak? Aye. Member Samani? Aye. Uh, Member Harris? Aye. Member Doshi? Aye. Member Hannes? Aye. And Board President Hughes? Aye. The motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? So Second. <laughs> Greg Harris? Aye. Second is Karat Doshi. Okay. Dr. Russell, will you please call roll? Member Olchak? Aye. Member Samani. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Uh, Member Weiner. Aye. And Board President Hughes. Aye. The meeting is now adjourned at 9.34 p.m. Well done. Well done. Oh, I don't like, I don't like doing